Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at a night sky daub structure. That's right, just a daub structure. What is that? Well, if you're old enough, you remember back in the day, we're talking 1990s and 2000s, if you had a big mirror, you could contact somebody like Night Sky or Astro Systems or any number of outfits, and they would build you a structure around the mirror itself. So we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves here. Let's take a look at this. If you've just wandered into this channel from out in YouTube land and you're wondering what the heck is going on, this is an astronomical telescope. It's designed for looking up at the night sky. Its design is that of a reflector. There is a 16 inch mirror back here. I have it capped right now because we're outdoors. We don't want to be pointing it anywhere near the sun. It deflects the light into the secondary mirror and it comes out here. This is the eyepiece, this is where you look, and you focus by using the focuser here. To change magnifications, you change eyepieces. Its mount is called a Dobsonian mount, named after John Dobson, the San Francisco amateur astronomer credited with popularizing its design. Okay, well, how does this work? Well, how do you get a mirror? That's one of the first things that we talk about. How do you wind up with a big mirror? Well, it turns out that Meade had a 16-inch Starfinder daub right around this time. Now, the 16-inch Starfinder was not a good telescope, but Meade sold a lot of these things, and over the years, the mirrors tend to stay while the structures either got thrown away or they disintegrated somehow or people tossed them. The structures were not very good, sonotube and particle board. In fact, I got mine in the early 2000s when someone in Manchester, New Hampshire had a 16-inch Starfinder daub in his basement. The basement flooded and water and sonotube and particle board don't mix. It's kind of like the scene in The Wizard of Oz where you throw water on her and all that's left is the broom. Well, that happened here when the basement got flooded. The only thing that was left of any value was the mirror itself. And even today, across the country, there are, I don't know, countless 16-inch F4.5 Mead Starfinder mirrors just kind of waiting for a home. And so people like this, Night Sky, this was Jim out of Louisiana. He doesn't do this anymore, but he pretty much built an entire company around this one idea. When I got my 16-inch mirror, I contacted him again in 2002, and he built one of these structures for me. At the time, prices very reasonable, $1,800, and he would accommodate certain little features if you wanted them, like this one has a feather touch focuser. I should never have sold that telescope, but I did. And lo and behold, it's 2024, almost 20 years later, and another one of these shows up. Okay, so how did this thing get here? Well, the owner of this telescope was a club member who bought one a couple of years after I bought mine. And in fact, there were three or four people in the club, including the club itself, who bought one of these after I got mine. Mine was an earlier version. This one actually is a little bit better. It's about 10 pounds lighter than the version that I got. Still, it weighs about 122 pounds. That includes about the 23 pound mirror assembly. And of the pieces, the mirror box is by far the heaviest at around 46 pounds without the mirror in it. Now, the mirror cell itself does come off. There are four bolts on the corners that you can do to undo to remove the mirror cell, and that will reduce the weight of that even further so that the most heavy item that you have is the rocker box itself at around 30 pounds. Okay, so he bought a house, and in the basement of the house, there was a Mead 16-inch Starfinder. And at the time, he didn't even know what it was, but he talked to the owner and he says, yeah, I bought that, I've never used it, I couldn't get it to work. Tell you what, if you buy the house, you can have the telescope, I'll just throw it in. And he actually started to learn a little bit on the Starfinder, but found out that these structures were available and wound up ordering one of these. Then as he, you know, age and health problems started to get him, the telescope sat in his garage for anywhere between 11 and 14 years, he's not really sure, and decided, well, it's about time to donate this thing. So I went over and took a look at it, and oh my goodness, take a look at this. I think that by removing the telescope, we may have inadvertently made some mice and squirrels homeless in the process. Look at all those discarded acorns taking off the mirror cover. That is the mirror itself. Oh, wow, look at that. I did wind up cleaning this, we rinsed it off with a hose, and then I took it back and very, very gently, several passes to make the mirror cleaner. And with a light touch, 
I got it to this stage here that you're seeing. Now there is some greasy sort of residue on there. I'm assuming that's animals living there or just, you know, being on top of it or something. There are some sections of the coating that have gotten thin. It may be because of that or because of the age of the, the uh, mirror itself. Now, how is the mirror? Well, he said it's a Mead Starfinder typical mirror and I have found over the years that those things varied quite a bit. Mine was pretty good. This one had a pretty serious turned edge. So he contacted Pegasus Optics and they refigured and resurfaced it for him. So this is essentially a Pegasus mirror, which is quite nice. It's one of the premium brands. So given that he got the mirror for free, he doesn't have that much in it. Take a look at the bottom of the rocker box. Oh, wow, that's the electronics. This one does have the motorized electronic package. So we made the difficult decision to just remove the electronics. We didn't even bother to power this stuff up. And some of these parts have already gone to other club members to help some of their older electronic systems get up and working. So after taking off all the electronics, the scope lost about three pounds and a lot of complexity. And I personally kind of like it this way anyway. Overall, the mirror box, I think, is very well designed. There is an 18-point flotation cell, and in lieu of a sling, there are those curved pieces of metal where the mirror sits. And as I think about it, I think I might actually prefer that to the traditional sling arrangement that you see in the Star Masters and the Obsessions. Like the Obsessions, if you set the scope on its back, it does rest on its collimation screws. A lot of people are bothered by this, but I found with this and with the Obsession that it doesn't really mess with the collimation very much. Another question I get is how does this thing hold collimation over time? You know, you're driving it around, you're putting the mirror in, you're taking the mirror out, you keep doing this over and over again. Collimation has got to get affected. Well, I'm not really sure why, but in all of the large aperture telescopes I've seen that are well designed like this one, the collimation holds a lot better than you think it does. I do carry a laser collimator. I happen to have a laser max and I find there is only minor touch up required every time I put this thing together. And in fact, when I did put this thing together for the first time after having been you know, sitting for so long, I barely had to touch the collimation at all. Okay, so this is how I normally store a big daub rolling platform that I built myself, mirror box on top of the rocker box, and the truss just on top like this. Now there's a couple of different philosophies as to how you might build a Dobsonian. You can go light and lean, or you can go big and heavy and strong. The obsessions might be thought of as being towards the light and lean category, the Star Masters and this night sky towards the heavier, heavy, you know, stronger heavy duty type of philosophy. One thing I don't know if it's coming across on video, this thing is beautifully finished. This does not in any way look like a homemade product. And Jim, while I haven't seen all of the other models, made custom designs for 12 to 18 inch telescopes. And if you wanted a mirror yourself, he would be able to source one for you. So you could buy the whole telescope from him if you wanted to. All right, so one characteristic of the larger, heavier design is that the truss poles, instead of going outside the, the mirror box, as on an obsession, it actually goes inside the mirror box like this. Another design consideration is that there are usually eight pole truss pole designs. Do you want eight individual poles like on an obsession? Those are smaller and lighter to handle. Or do you want to make an A-frame where there are four sets of these doubled up truss poles? Obviously he has gone for the latter design here. So these thread right into the mirror box here, go ahead and do that. All right, so now I've said this before, but the moment of truth for any big dob assembly is the installation of the upper truss. You are probably going to be on a ladder at some point, and these four screws thread into holes at the top here. Now you can left justify or you can right justify the upper truss assembly. Now I happen to be left-handed, so I usually put it on the left-hand side. Now the 
The, pro the reason this is the moment of truth is because there will be at least a few moments before you get the first one screwed down where this thing is just sort of hanging here out in space. So I always feel better when I get the first one in. Now there is a shroud here, by the way, they threw this in with a lot of the other manufacturers. You had to pay extra for the shroud. I very often just leave this thing off, unless you're in a very light polluted environment. You know, you can leave this off, it's not that big a deal. Eyepiece and finder, the eyepiece and the focuser, and there's a tell rad here. And just like that, you are ready to go. Now, he did also include wheelbarrow handles. Those two thread into these holes on the rocker box if you want to move it around that way. I just use a rolling platform. So that's pretty much it. It didn't really take that much time. The first time you do this, it's going to take you a while, but you'll get it down to the point where, I don't know, from unloading to the car to observing could be less than 15 minutes and very often even less than 10 minutes. Okay, so how is it? You know, it's been a while since I've used a really big telescope. For whatever reason, the review samples that have been coming through here lately have been smaller scopes. But you know, it really feels good to have something like this at your disposal for those nights when you really want to stop goofing off and really get out there and do something. So I did look through the Virgo cluster with this. It is fantastic. One disadvantage with such a big telescope is the M, the Messier objects, and some of the brighter NGCs are kind of hard to identify because there are so many galaxies in the field of view. You'll be zipping along from M59, for example, to M60 to M58, and along the way you'll see these little hazy things go, you know, careening past the eyepiece. You're like, what is that? <laughs> you know? If you look at my reviews lately, you'll see just how often I say things like, you know, the telescope was just able to get M65, M66, and NGC 3628 in LEO. With this thing, no question at all. You're seeing all three of them. They are big and bright in the eyepiece. Same thing for M81 and M82 with a 26 millimeter Nagler Type 5, an eyepiece I really wish that they would bring back. You can also see the two companion galaxies that are nearby, NGC 2985 and NGC 3077. Those are pretty small, but through this telescope, those tiny companion galaxies actually look like M81 and M82 in a normal-sized telescope. I looked at NGC 4565, and the dust lane through it is very plainly visible. Looking at globular clusters like M3 and M13, you can resolve them all the way out to the core. You can see color in some of the stars. Many stars in globular clusters are red, and you can detect that here. Near M13, there is a little galaxy, NGC 6207. That is a test for a 4-inch telescope. With this thing, no problem whatsoever. It's there. So if you're curious about the size, here is a comparison with a known quantity. This is my trusty 8-inch Dobsonian. Now with a larger telescope like this, you are going to have to carry around a ladder. I find for me two steps is all I need to get to the eyepiece, even at its zenith. You know, the market for big Dobbs has tanked recently. I'm not entirely sure why. Some of it has to do with the aging of our hobby. Older astronomers tend to lose their enthusiasm for hauling around big pieces of gear, and also the younger people entering the hobby tend to be interested in imaging gear. And that's fine, but if you've always wanted a big daub, now is the time to buy. I've seen tremendous bargains out there. I've seen nice telescopes like this one almost given away. So keep an eye out if this interests you. So there you have it, a look at the night sky structure from the early 2000s for a Mead 16-inch f4.5 mirror. I hope you found this video entertaining and interesting. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.